All right, I guess we'll proceed. Um, yeah, so we're going to talk about integrating Snowflake and R. My name is Ralph Braun. I'm a senior solutions engineer with Snowflake, and I'm joined by Rika Gorn uh, from Posit. And, and so what we're going to do today, we'll go through a quick agenda here. Uh, we're going to start with the Snowflake overview, go through some slides, then we'll go into a live demo. After that, I'm going to hand it over to Rika. She's going to show us R within Snowflake, and we'll also share some, some materials if you want to get hands-on with it and we'll go into a Q&A. Uh, I know we have a large group, um, but feel free to jump in if you have questions and we'll try and manage that. Uh, we do have a fair bit of content to cover, so I will move at a, a fairly quick speed though. And again, thank you all for joining us. And so let's dive into a few slides here. I'm gonna start off with an introduction to Snowflake and, and Snowflake is a, is a cloud data platform. And so when we think of platforms and Snowflake in particular, uh, some common attributes are you know speed, simplicity, uh, cost, total cost of ownership, and governance. So let's take a look, right? So as we look at most organizations in, in the landscape today, there's there's lots of data silos, different departments, different people have different uh, access to data. Data can live in different cloud platforms, and that can really lead to a lot of complexity, right? With that complexity comes higher costs, security risks, and Snowflake's goal is, is to remove silos, right? That could be data silos, that could be development silos, and, and once we have Snowflake in place, without the silos, the, the benefits are great, right? We can simplify your data foundation. All your workloads can be centralized within one platform. Uh, we can accelerate AI. That's you know a hot topic in this day and age. But you know for AI, you know a key part of that is clean, trusted data that we can all access. And um, then finally, scale with applications, right? Once we have the data foundation, we can streamline the development process and help you productionalize your data. So that's kind of the high level of what Snowflake is about. And so let's you know, continue a little bit further on that data foundation. And looking at the slide here, you know, what happens with silos? What are the challenges? That's gonna be the left side of this slide. On the right side is gonna be you know, the benefits of eliminating those silos, right? Go from endless silos of data, again, operational complexity, lots of data movement with Snowflake and a unified platform, those silos are eliminated. Um, and again, we're able to centralize and open access to all data for all team members. So everyone's looking at the same data and working with the same data. From a cost perspective, silos can be you know, very difficult to manage. You might need a lot of uh, expert skills. Um, some of those skills can be very difficult to find. Whereas with Snowflake, it is a fully managed service, supports multiple users and workloads, reducing time, effort, and expertise. And then from a governance perspective, Snowflake is going to bring the code to the data, right? So we're going to get out of the, the process of moving data around. Uh, once you're moving data around, that can leave an ecosystem. It can be difficult to secure that data and know who has access to it. Whereas with Snowflake, we're centralizing the data, able to apply governance and rules and policies to that to make sure the right people have the right access to be able to do their job. Continuing on, looking at the Snowflake platform architecture, it is a unified platform. Um, and again, we want to get those silos minimized and looking at the four different key layers, it starts in the middle with optimized storage, right? We can handle all different types of data, you know, be it, you know, of course, structured data, but also semi-structured and unstructured. So again, the point being uh, limitless scale for storage, all different data types can be stored within Snowflake. From a compute perspective, there's one single compute engine. So you can do all of your work within that compute engine, you know, be it Python, Java, Scala, uh, SQL, of course. Uh, but again, we can do all those different activities within our compute. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how that compute is scalable and how we can, can manage that compute across different teams. So teams have the right resources to, to do their job effectively. From a cloud services perspective, uh, sharing and collaboration, security and governance, high availability, uh, performance optimization. And then finally, the outer layer is SnowGrid. And that's where we're looking at the ability for, for cross-cloud global access. We realize yourself and your partners might be working in different clouds, uh, but that is not a problem with Snowflake. We can share data across all those different platforms, ensure availability, um, failover, disaster recovery, and so forth. So we have you covered from all of those different aspects uh, within the architecture. Talking about the Elastic Compute. So what Snowflake did is, is we have separated storage from compute. So we've got nearly infinite scale storage, but then also the compute 
can uh, we have the, a concept we call separating compute from compute. So as we look at this slide here, um, there's, there's five different boxes, right? We have the dev and QA team. We have the ETL team, applications team, data science, BI reporting. Each of those could be different departments or teams within an organization. And each of those teams can have their own compute resources all working off the same data. So they can manage their compute. They can scale it up as needed. They can scale it out as needed. Uh, but they've got full control, one engine to manage and to govern, so they can also have policies in place to ensure that you know, cost controls uh, are happening uh, and that there's no surprises from a cost perspective. So again, the key here being from a scalability perspective, scaling across, handling competing workloads, different teams have different needs, scaling up as you have more complex queries, we have the ability to, to resize compute on the fly, and then as you have more users, we can do what we call scaling out. Uh, so we might have multiple computes uh, for to handle simultaneous queries. Then building on here, so from a uh, machine learning perspective, again, single platform, end-to-end -end machine learning, Snowflake can Park container services give you the ability to code you know, using Python, Java, or Scala. Again, the key here, using secure calls to your favorite libraries. Um, and then we also have Streamlit built into Snowflake. So you can you know, run Python code within Snowflake, then also visualize that via a Streamlit application, right? So again, the concept here, we're moving, we're not moving data, we're bringing the code to the data. Again, that's gonna help with speed, efficiency, security, and governance. And then finally, from an AI perspective, um, generative AI is, is a huge topic in this day and age. So we're bringing easy to use security and governance to that as well. Govern data and models is at the foundation of this. And then capabilities to incorporate LLMs into analytical processes. Uh, some use cases within you know, minutes and seconds, such as document AI, uh, Snowflake Copilot. And then on the right-hand side here, we can create more you know, fully custom applications, uh, often leveraging Snowflake Snowpark container services um, so again, you've got the full gamut covered uh, from an AI platform perspective from, from simple to complex. Again, coming back to that secure governed data foundation that it's all built on top of. Talking a bit about data collaboration, traditional methods, right? As you're working with different teams or different organizations, a lot of times that involves the movement of data, right? Could be FTP, could be APIs, ETL, um, and what's happening in those scenarios is, you know, once that data is, is moved to a different, you know, you've exported something and shared it with someone, you've lost control of it. You can quickly not, you know, realize who has control to what. Um, and so there can be, you know, ramifications of that could be from a time perspective, could be from a cost perspective, um, and just simple, you know, governance and, and making sure that the right people have right access to the data, th those controls can be lost once you're in the process of moving data around. Whereas with Snowflake, uh, we have the ability to, to share that, right? So we've eliminated the complexities there, accelerating collaboration that can be across your team or across your ecosystem. There might be trusted partners that you wanna be able to share a data set with. Uh, within a few commands, we can open up a share where other individuals have the ability to query that data. Again, that's very quick and simple as opposed to moving data around. And again, with our approach, you're able to maintain the security and governance of the data. Then finally, looking at the marketplace, uh, there is a full marketplace of data and applications, right? So there's data sets that can be shared. There's 18 different categories. So for example, if you want to find a, a healthcare related data set, uh, you can search for that. You might find uh, COVID-19 related uh, research data sets, um, census data sets, weather, geography. So the point being is there's lots of different data assets, many of which are freely available. Some are for cost. So depending on you know, your use case and so forth, you can, can filter and query accordingly. And then also from an application perspective, there's an application marketplace and that's where POSIT comes into play. We're gonna show you how you can uh, use POSIT from the marketplace and access your secure trusted Snowflake data with that as well. So that was kind of a quick run through um, of, of what Snow, Snowflake is. Now let's shift over to a demo. And what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna start by orienting you to the interface, right? So I'm looking at Snowflake. 
Uh, in here, I have a number of different databases, and this is this is our, our, our primary user interface, Snow Site, that a lot of uh, our customers use. But then there's other options as well. There's you know CLIs available, connectors for Python and Spark, drivers, uh, Visual Studio Code extensions. So if you have a favorite IDE, uh, we can integrate that and allow you to, to work in the tool of your choice. But looking at the interface, let's just do a quick orientation. So on the left-hand side, I've, I'm going to start with data, right? And so I've got a number of databases. So each of these items here represents a database. And if I want to, I can drill into one. So I have the uh, Frostbite Social Determinants of Health database. So I'm going to drill into that. And then in there, below that, I can see a number of different schemas, right? So if I want to, for example, I can go into my harmonized schema. This is where maybe we've curated the data. Um, we've gone from raw to a harmonized, more usable uh, format. Now I want to see what tables exist there. So I can drill into that. I can see I've got about a dozen tables, but I want to find out more about the patient key metrics. I can simply drill into that. And then there I can see the definition of the table. I can see the, the data definition language, how it was defined. Then I can also look at, at the privileges. So a key concept within Snowflake is, is role-based access control. And so with role-based access control, what we're doing with that is we're, we're ensuring uh, a couple things, right? The right access to the right roles. So you can see the appropriate data based on your job function, but then also capabilities within the system as well. So, you know, some users are going to have the ability to create objects, whereas some other users might not. They might simply use data and objects that were created by someone else. And if I want to look closer at this particular P, uh, patient key metrics table, I can see the columns. I can do a data preview if I want to understand a little bit more about, you know, what's in this table. Uh, I can scroll across and, and get a feel for what's there. Okay, so that, that's one example. Um, another schema we can look in. So in this particular schema, we had tables and views. Uh, but if I go down to the analytics schema, we see that we've got a little bit more going on there, right? So it all depends on, on how you want to lay things out. So in that schema, we've got tables and views. We've also got stages. That's where we might have data that's staged to be loaded. Uh, we have functions, stored procedures, so lots of capabilities that you would, would typically see in a database uh, type of application. So that's a quick orientation of, of databases and some of the objects within there and how you would navigate it. Moving down below that, we're going to go into data products, and this is the marketplace I had talked about, right? So within my environment here, I can go into the marketplace, and if I scroll down, I can see some of the, you know, the featured providers, what apps are out there, what are some of the native apps, I can see connectors, see some of the popular data shares. So here I have the, the COVID-19 epidemiological data. I've got some census data. These happen to be free. Um, and then I would simply click into that. Um, and then I can bring that data into my environment and that would exist as a database that we can query and then join with other data within the environment. Moving through apps, this is an example from the marketplace. I've installed a couple apps, one of which is the Posit Workbench, and Enrica is going to be going into that shortly. Uh, AIML, those capabilities are in here. So again, back to my comment earlier about bringing the code to the data, right? So we've got the data in, and now we're bringing all these different capabilities so you're not having to move data. Uh, rather, you can focus on the code and getting value and leveraging the data that you've brought in. Looking at some of our models here. Uh, let's see here. Back in the AIML, we've got forecasting models, uh, anomaly detection, classification. Um, so there's lots going on there. We could have a full session just on you know, AI, ML types of capabilities. Moving down below from a monitoring perspective. So a lot of times we want to be able to understand what's happening in an environment. Um, and here, every query that's run in Snowflake is going to wind up in what we call query history. And then from here, we have the ability uh, to drill into to queries, right? First off, I can see the SQL text, the query ID, the status, the user, the warehouse, and then I can drill into a statement. Then I can see the, the statement that was run. I can see the results. I can see the query profile if I want to understand, you know, what's going on under the covers in terms of, uh, you know, resource usage and so forth. From a governance perspective, I can drill in here and understand we have the ability to tag tables with sensitive columns, right? And we'll get into this when we, we go into the uh, the demo I'm going to launch in a few minutes here. But the idea being, 
you might have sensitive data. We have the ability to tag those columns, right? So some of these, you know, could be date of birth, could be name, could be social security, gender, whatever is in your environment. We have the ability to tag that data. And then we can define policies on top of that masking policy. So some users might not be able to see the phone numbers, for example, or they might not need to see names because that might not be relevant to do their job. So again, you can apply policies uh, back to that notion of role-based access control where we're allowing the right users to see just the right information you know, they need to do their job. And then finally, a couple things from the, the admin perspective, uh, being able to understand you know, usage in the environment. Um, the concept is those, those warehouses, the compute warehouses. So here I have the ability to see you know, warehouses by cost. I can see databases by storage. So the point being, you're not flying blind here. You have visibility into all these metrics, uh, both from a cost and a resource usage perspective. That's all part of the platform. Then I can also define what we call resource monitors on top of, of warehouses. I have just one monitor built here, but the point being is you can specify thresholds. So you know you might have the uh, a certain amount of compute that you're going to use over the period of a month. And you can set thresholds and alerts, um, notify me when I've used 80% of my threshold, uh, 90, 95. And again, you can customize that. So the point is there that you have the ability to, to understand what's going on. And then finally, if I want to create a warehouse, maybe you need more compute. Um, it's a simple point and click operation, right? So I can give my warehouse a name. Uh, I can go ahead and give it a size. I can go into advanced options. I can select if I want to auto resume or auto suspend. So the point there is that you have compute resources, but you only want them to be turned on when you're actually using them. So we can automatically shut off those resources. So no cost is incurred um, to, to just have them simply idly running, waiting for activity to come. So that can be a big saver from a resource consumption perspective. So now let's take a look at, a little bit closer at, at how we actually will interact with the system, right? So a lot of that was kind of the behind the scenes. Uh, the concept here is projects. So on the left-hand side, uh, worksheets are where we're commonly running SQL statements. And I have a, a scenario here. Um, this is the social determinants of health. And what we're wanting to do is understand a little bit more about patients that miss appointments. And so this is a SQL worksheet. And what's happening here, I'll just kind of walk through this here, right? So back to that concept of, of role-based access control, I'm gonna select the role I wanna use. I'm gonna use the data engineer role. So again, that particular role is gonna dictate, you know, what columns, which databases I have access. So I'm gonna run a couple commands and I'm also specifying the warehouse that I wanna use. So I'm using the uh, analytics, social determinants of health warehouse, and I can see that the commands completed successfully. All right, so I'm doing some work in that database. Now I wanna take a look at, you know, I've got a particular schema, what are the tables in there? So let's take a look at that. And so we'll just kind of walk through uh, these scenarios here. Again, we wanna understand, you know, we've got a population, we wanna understand by age, maybe by location, by gender, what's going on. And so here's is the process we're gonna flow through that. All right, so I can see the tables in that particular schema name, when they were created, the size of those tables. Uh, so all those other types of, of metrics about that table. Uh, and now let's go ahead and run some SQL statements here, right? So I want to find out a little bit about the breakdown of this population. I want to see the gender and just the numbers. Pretty simple statement. So I've got that. I'm going to run it and I can see, right? So we've got the, uh, the female and the male. We've got a count of those members. Maybe we want to take that a little bit further and be able to understand uh, the age categories as well. So I've got a simple case statement here. And so that's what we're running here, right? So now we can see the, the gender and we're going to bucket them by different age categories. So that's great. Um, and then maybe we want to continue to understand more about our population, right? It can be a challenge as we get data, like, is it clean? Is it trusted? Do we have duplicates? Are all the member names consistent? So we can do some, what we'll call fuzzy matching. And this is a simple example here. I'm gonna do a select and I'm, I'm using some likes, um, but we're gonna do something a little bit more sophisticated. But in this case, I found the, the names um, that start, that contain J-O and end 
and start with TE, then last names with Berg and Strom. Um, so I was able to find those, those people. Uh, but we want to take it a step further. And here I'm going to show too. So maybe the concept is that you've got a real complex query that you want to run and you want to be able to use more compute. So on the fly, what I can do is I'm going to change the size of my warehouse, right? I had been using uh, what was an extra small warehouse, but now we need more compute. So I'm going to run a command here for this particular statement. And again, you can put permissions on who has the ability to change the size of warehouses. But now I'm going to scale up this particular warehouse. So it's going to be extra large and it's going to run faster. And so what I want to do here is something a little bit more sophisticated from a fuzzy matching perspective. I'm going to use the edit distance function, right? And so what that does is it helps find the... Uh, 11 shine distance between two input strings. So if you have names that are similar, we're going to be able to identify them. That's what's happening in this statement here. So let's run it and see the output of that. And so we've run that and then we'll see here. So we've got a couple columns here, right? We've got a first name, last name, first name, last name. So these are our two different um, sets. Then we're going to do the distance, first name distance and last name distance. And so this is going to help me find people that might potentially be the same thing. So if we look at our third line here, I have Chuck Hills, then I have Chuck Hill, right? So that could be the same person. And so we're making it easy to, to identify those types of, of close matches, fuzzy matches, so to say. And then from there, you might, might do some further analysis on that data. And then you can rule in if this person you know, is indeed the same person or if they're different. Uh, so we've run, uh, theoretically, a very complex statement. So let's go ahead and make our warehouse small. I'm going to resize it. And then let's do some more things here, right? So we're a little bit concerned about PII data, right? So we've got some sensitive data, but we want to understand a little bit more about the member table. So I'm going to do a select from that table. And let's take a look uh, what the data looks like. So... In this particular table, I can see the results across the bottom. I can see the member ID, the person ID, first name, last name. I can see the phone number, the age. So some of this data is, is a bit sensitive, right? We don't necessarily need everyone to have access to that. So it would be great if we had the ability to, to mask that data, right? And this is gonna do a combination of tagging the data, masking it and applying rules based on someone's role-based access control. So I'm gonna do a couple things here. I'm gonna extract the semantic categories. So we're doing some metadata operations where we're able to pull, uh, able to view the metadata and determine you know, what kind of data we're looking at. Um, and then what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to call another function here and we're gonna to start to apply tags to tables. So again, the idea is that we've got a table with potentially sensitive PII data. We wanna tag those columns. And then we're going to want to go ahead and start to, to do things so that we can mask the data so that based on someone's role, they are going to see just the data that's appropriate. Um, so we've added categories to five columns. Let's take a look at this. So now I can run a select. And this select is going to show me for that particular table, the tag name, this category, the tag values, and then the columns. So we can see that we have some sensitive data here, right? First name, last name, and phone number, we've tagged them. So that's the first step, right? So we've tagged the definition of that table. Now we wanna go ahead and create policies. So I'm gonna create a couple policies. And the first policy here is gonna be based on the name tag, right? And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, if your role is an account admin, a sysadmin, or a BISDOH, then you're going to see the full value of that table. But if you are not one of those, instead of showing the name, we're going to return masked. So the theory would be that, you know, people don't need to know names to be able to do some particular analysis. So I'm going to run that. So we're, we've applied a policy to that data. Um, then we're going to do the same thing for phone number, same concept. And in this case, uh, instead of showing the phone number, we're going to show um, the first the area code, and then we're going to default everything to a bunch of nines. So let's do that. So we have applied a masking policy. And so let's do this here. 
or we've created the policy, now we're going to apply the policy. So now we're gonna alter each of those tables so that policy exists on it. Now we're gonna take a look at that in action, right? So again, the concept is we found some sensitive data, we've tagged it, now we've applied a mask, and then based on my role in the environment, I may or may not be able to see the actual values. So I'm going to the data engineer, SDOH role. In that particular role, it does not have the ability to see all of the data. So let's run a statement on that. And here's the results, right? So as we look at the first name and last name, instead of seeing those names, we're seeing that they are masked. Then same for phone number, we're gonna see the area code, but then the rest of that is defaulted to 999, right? So that again is a great way to secure and control you know, what data is visible um, we also have a concept, so that was a masking policy. We also have a concept of row level security so that when someone runs a query, they might not see all the records. Um, so with that policy in place, we can still do our analysis here. We, we want to find out appointments that have been missed across the patient population. I'm going to run that statement. And again, perfect. It doesn't matter. I don't need to see those, those sensitive columns to do my meaningful analysis here. I can run another statement. Again, see more about appointment counts and totals, and then continuing that analysis, right? So again, we've masked the data, but we're still able to do analysis on it. Um, all right, for the sake of time here, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit. So that was just kind of orienting you a little bit to what's possible in Snowflake. Um, now I'm gonna show you a couple examples, right? So along the social determinants of health, here's an example of a streamlet application. I need to refresh this here, I need to wake it up. Uh, but the idea is that I'm running Python code within Snowflake. Um, then we're going to be able to show a map. So we wanted to find, you know, folks that have missed their appointments. Wouldn't it be great to see a map of them, see that the geographical data, and we can display all of that within Snowflake. So again, we've got our Python code running in Snowflake. Uh, we're going to generate a map. Uh, if I want to, I can select a medical type. Maybe I want to find hospitals that are near my patients. That's going to update, and then I can zoom in. The green dots represent patients. The red, the purple represent uh, hospitals. And then I can can mouse over that, and I can see what's going on there. Right. So we've we've done our analysis. Now we're able to visualize that in a map, and then use that to again identify at risk patients. Maybe we can direct them to a facility um, that is close to them that they might not have realized existed. So that was one example where we're using what we call a streamlet app. Again, all in Snowflake, keeping your trusted data there, moving the code to the data. Then one other simple uh, application we'll show here. This is a streamlet application where we have brought in some medical research data with a bunch of PDFs. Um, and then we're gonna apply an LLM and be able to ask questions of that data using the model of our choice. So I'm gonna enter a query here. And, and the query is, can you summarize the types of research that Dr. Azizi did? So again, the idea is that we brought in a bunch of medical research papers. Now we're using an LLM and, and putting ourselves in a position to ask questions of that data. I'll hit enter, that's gonna run. So again, that data stays in Snowflake. And then here we can see a summary of, of what Dr. Azizi has done. He's involved in various aspects of research goes down the list. And if I want to, I can even try a different uh, model. Maybe I want to try the Llama 270B chat model and see what that produces. And that's got a slightly different format, right? So again, just the idea here is that we brought in PDF data, put it into a vector store within Snowflake, and then we're able to apply an, an LLM and, and ask questions of that data. We also have chat bot types of capabilities to do that as well. But Hopefully this has given you a bit of a flavor of, of what's possible within Snowflake. Um, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm gonna hand it over to Rika and let her uh, take it from the approach of, of bringing posit, uh, using the posit application within Snowflake um, to, to run your R code again within Snowflake without having to move the data out, uh, helping you ensure that the governance of the data and so forth and the right access. So I have stopped sharing, Rika, it's over to you. Thanks Ralph. All right, I'm going to share my screen. One moment. Okay. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? Yep, looks good. Amazing. All right. 
Um, so I just have a few slides and then I'm gonna do a quick demo and then uh, end with some resources that you can utilize if you're interested in learning how to run R in Snowflake. So uh, first, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Rika Gorn. I am a senior solutions engineer at Posit. Uh, what that means is that I spend a lot of my time uh, tinkering with various uh, products and working with data scientists. We also help folks uh, who are using the Posit Pro tools um, maintain, install, and kind of use them to you know to to your needs. Um, you uh, may have heard of Posit, you may not have heard have heard of Posit, but uh, I'm pretty sure most of the folks here have heard of our studio, which is what we were formerly known as, and we rebranded as Posit about two years ago. Um, and I can explain a little bit of the name change for those who are not familiar. Um, so the idea is that 50% of what we do, uh, of what Posit works on is open source, uh, including kind of the open source for the R, R community, um, including the R Studio IDE, as well as kind of popular packages such as Shiny and Tidyverse. Um, for the last few years, we've been working on providing tools for data scientists that are not uh, just for R users, but also Python users, sort of multilingual. The idea is there are many tools out there. You have to use the right tool for the right job. Sometimes it's gonna be R, sometimes it's gonna be something else. And so we rebranded about two years ago uh, to be known as Posit, because when we were known as RStudio, it was hard to convince folks that, you know, we also worked in um, the Python and larger data science space. Um, in general, our mission is to create open source software for data science, scientific research, and technical communications. And we're going to we do this by enhancing the production and consumption of knowledge by everyone, regardless of economic means. So, a little bit more about uh, what we actually uh, do. So, here are our um, Posit Enterprise solutions. So, like I said, fifty percent of what Posit does our, is work on open source, including open source RStudio IDE, open source packages. Uh, the other half of Posit uh, provides enterprise solutions that are sort of uh, enterprise grade versions of a lot of our open source uh, open source solutions. The idea is that you know when you're writing code locally, that's fabulous. But sometimes, but once you're in a larger company. Uh, there may be security and IT needs around data security, around authentication, around CI, CD. Um, and a lot of our kind of solutions provide those enterprise grade features for the R open source products that folks use and hopefully love. Um, so what are these products? Very, very briefly, we have Posit Workbench, Posit Connect, Posit Package Manager, and a few others called Academy and Cloud. The idea is that Posit Workbench, this is your development environment, and this is a browser-based, server-based uh, um, product that allows you to write code in your RStudio IDE, but from a server. This also gives you the ability to write code in other editors, including VS Code, Jupyter Lab, and Jupyter Notebook. Um, then we all have Connect, and Connect is sort of the, the deployment, the production space where you're able to share the content that you create. You're able to share um, our Shiny applications, Markdown, Quarto, um, APIs that you're creating. Uh, just R scripts, Python scripts, Python applications, Python APIs, and then have um, granular access controls for folks who are able to see or not see those applications. And then pa uh, Posit Package Manager is an administrative level product. We also have a public version of this that serves packages as well as pre-compiled binaries for packages from CRAN, PyPI, Bioconductor, as well as any internally developed packages. And so what this allows you to do, right, is when you're uh, pulling packages locally and then deploying them elsewhere, you don't have this problem of, well, it works on my computer, but then when I deploy, everything crashes because I can't find a particular package. So it allows for really, really good reproducibility, which is, I think, especially important when you're working with things like trials, where you need to have this 100% reproducibility today, but also five, 10 years from now. Um, so the idea, right, is, 
you as developers are writing your code in Positive Workbench, you're connecting to data, whether that data is in Snowflake, whether it's in a CSV, whether it's in some other databases, then once you're done with that, uh, what you have produced, you're able to publish that on Positive Connect and share and disseminate that both internally and externally, and then use Posit Package Manager as sort of this administrative level product that allows for reproducibility and allows for uh, kind of all of your packages to be uh, served in all of your environments, both production as well as development. So how does this all relate to Snowflake? How are you able to run our code in Snowflake? The idea is that, um, we have created um, a native application to run Workbench. And so Workbench is that development environment where you're able to run your R code. Um, so the way that this works is that the native application is available as a listing on Snowflake's marketplace, and it will run completely within the Snowflake ecosystem. So you no longer have to worry about kind of data going across networks, across firewalls, from your database into your like local development environment. It all happens within Snowflake. And so uh, you get kind of the benefits of Snowflake security. You get the benefits of Snowflake role-based access controls. Um, and then you're able to utilize all of the editors within Posit Workbench. So you can use our Studio IDE, you can use Jupyter Lab, you can use VS Code, and you can run your R code. Um, and have kind of your data there and all of your roles automatically and nicely pass through into that environment. Um, so why would you want to do this? Um, the idea is your application is installed within your Snowflake environment. So uh, if you already are using Snowflake and it's a, um, a tool that has been uh, accepted, right, and validated by your security IT teams, then you're sort of good to go, right? You know, you don't have to bring another tool. You don't have to get approval for anything else. You're able to run the RIDE alongside your Snowflake data uh, within your Snowflake environment. You don't need to, you know, get additional IT security support. It's there. You just need to uh, get access to that application and you can sort of start right away with very, very little um, uh, setup on the server side of things and yet you're still getting the benefit of a centralized server setup, right? You're no longer developing locally. You don't have to worry about uh, downloading ODBC drivers and all of that kind of gnarly stuff that happens when you want to um, connect to a database. It's sort of abstracted away for, from you and done on your behalf. Um, Administrators don't have to wor worry about giving you any additional data authorization or security into your RStudio IDE. The data that you're able to see on the Snowflake side is the data that you're able to see within your RStudio IDE. It happens once on the Snowflake side. And when you're writing your code, you can write your R code um, and everything is kind of completely locked down. It also handles Snowflake credentials automatically. Uh, so you don't have to... Um, uh, you don't have to think about personal authentication tokens or having environmental variables or using username and passwords to connect to your Snowflake account. All of that is able to happen automatically using something we call our OAuth integration. The other nice thing about having this accessible as a native application is that um, we are going to be doing the auto upgrades for you, right? So you don't have to be thinking about upgrading your R versions and upgrading your packages and upgrading to the you know the the, the latest Docker image. It is it happens um, uh, through the native application, kind of on your behalf, and so you're always getting the newest and latest and greatest of features that are available that are created by our developers. All right, demo time, and. But before that, I just want to see quickly if there are any questions. Ah, how do you manage update manage packages with the appliance? So the um, in terms of managing upgrades for the native app, again, that's sort that's done on your behalf. Um, with updating and managing packages uh, from your CRAN or from your uh, Bioconductor or PyPI. 
the idea is it would be relatively similar to what you have now. You're going to be pointing your RStudio IDE within Snowflake to your package manager, right? So maybe you're using CRAN. Um, hopefully, you're uh, if you are uh, uh, if you're not using Posit Package Manager, you're at least using the public version of Package Manager. Um, the benefit there is it has a full CRAN mirror, so everything that lives on CRAN lives on uh, pack, uh, lives on Posit Package Manager. The only difference is you get pre-compiled binaries, so it's faster. You don't lose anything. It's just faster, plus you get a lot of nice metadata. Um, like someone mentioned in the chat, I like to use a package manager with something like RENV. And what RENV does is that it allows you to take a snapshot of your kind of environment for your project. And this snapshot includes which R version you're using, what packages you're using, what package versions you're using, um, what uh, where you have uh, where you install those packages from, and it kind of takes a snapshot similar to the way that virtual environments work when you're coding in Python. Um, and uh, what you're able to do is take a snapshot out of it and then recreate or rehydrate those packages anytime you want to, um, you know, go back to that state or if you want to share that project with, you know, with your team or put it on GitHub, et cetera. Um, what you're able to do is sort of um, uh, freeze your project state um, and uh, uh, always be able to kind of recreate it. So I, so RN is an open source R package, really uh, recommend folks checking it out. Um, in general, I also always recommend using uh, a project oriented workflow as opposed to just installing packages globally. Um, that way you can really make sure that when you are updating, managing, reproducing your packages, that can happen sort of on a on a granular project basis, as opposed to globally, which is going to slow things down for you, right? And it's just going to be kind of all over the place. Uh, so thanks for that, Raymond. All right, uh, quick demo. Um, so here I am in the um, Snowflake marketplace, and I've already um, gone to kind of the Posit Workbench listing. And so the idea is Posit Workbench is here. You're able to get the application directly from the public marketplace. All you would need is, is, a, is a license, but um, nothing has to happen kind of outside the ecosystem of Snowflake. It's already available. Um, it's going to be available in all regions uh, by uh, Monday, actually. And so it's going to be available to folks, those who are already using Posit Workbench. Um, it would just essentially be the same license you're already using. Um, and for those who are not, uh, you know, contact us, let us know, um, and you're able to get set up with that really, really quickly. So I'm going to jump over into my Posit Workbench environment. And so here I'm in Posit Workbench. Uh, for those who haven't um, seen this before, first thing I want to kind of note, right, is uh, let me actually. And so actually I'm going to um, authenticate into my um, into my Workbench environment. And so I'm authenticating. I have an integration with Okta, which um, and we integrate with various kinds of um, internet uh, identity providers. In this case, we're using Okta. So you can see that I am logged in, which is really nice. And again, something that your IT and security folks are probably really going to like. I have a variety of sessions that are available to me, but I can always open up a new session. And here um, I can open up different kinds of sessions. So I can open up a Jupyter Notebook, a Jupyter Lab, RStudio Pro, VS Code. If you're running this in um, you are able to kind of architect Workbench in a variety of different ways. If you're running it in a containerized environment or a Kubernetes environment, you're actually able to open up sessions of different sizes with different resource profiles available to them. So if you are, for example, coding with, like, and you need to use GPUs, right, you're using, or you maybe you're working on like genomics data, something like that, and you need a really, really big you know, Mongo machine, you're able to do that with um, with Workbench. You can also see that here I have an integration with Snowflake and I'm already signed in, um, you know, here with uh, with my Snowflake account. I am um, not going to open a one directly because I already have an, a session open to me. And so I'm going to just restore this session. Interesting. All right. 
activating and it's going to jump me through here. A few things that I want to also note. So this should look very, very familiar for folks who use the RStudio ID. There are a few additional niceties with using it in Workbench. One, I have access to multiple versions of R here, which is really nice. You don't have to worry about taking, you know, changing it manually. And I also have um, my uh, credentials. I'm actually going to uh, jump back in here. I'm going to, um, oh, sorry. Bench, one moment. So I'm going to, I'm going to sign in here. I'm going to allow the credentials. I'm going to authenticate. It is signing in. And I'm going to start the session again. So now you can kind of see the entire workflow. Amazing. And you can see that my develop the role that I have within Snowflake has automatically passed through into my session. I have not used any personal authentication tokens. I haven't used any um, system profiles or our environment fi uh, uh, files. It is all just kind of passed through and you don't really have to worry about that um, authentication. So you can imagine maybe you have certain roles that are associated with data sets um, and you only want you know, someone to see X, Y, and Z data, you're able to do that quite seamlessly with this integration. Um, so here I have my code. I'm using a Quarto document. For those who haven't used Quarto, highly, highly recommend it. It's really extensible. Um, you're able to use it for multiple languages. You're able to use it to um, uh, convert documents into um, websites, into blog posts, into widgets, into slides, into kind of all in one, everything you possibly want from one document. Um, in general, uh, what the way that it works is you have your text, you have markdown, and you have a YAML at the beginning. You can look at this both in the source code, but also in the visual mode um, here. And so you just have this little YAML bit on the top. The format in this case is HTML, but there's so many different formats that are available to you. It's really, really nice. Here, I'm going to be connecting to my data. I have my um, packages. This is very similar to the way that you would connect to other databases. But in this case, you don't need an ODBC driver, right? So the way that you would connect to PostgreSQL database, MariaDB, MySQL, et cetera, very similar. But I don't need that driver. And I don't need, as you'll see here in my connection um, pane, all I have is this Snowflake function. And then just the information for what data that I want access to, right? I don't have any tokens. I don't have any uh, environmental variables. I don't have any, you know, any secrets that I am, uh, that I have stored locally. Um, so this uh, data is connecting to data that's coming from Snowflake. Um, it is essentially, uh, in this case, I'm doing some analysis on web traffic data. And I'm just going to start this uh, connection. And here in my connections pane, I can kind of see the schemas, the warehouses, the databases that I'm looking at in um, in Snowflake. And I can see those available, which is just really nice. In this case, it says no tables because I'm actually looking at views. But the idea is that I have access to the sort of um, file uh, view of, uh, of the data that I'm accessing in, in Snowflake. And I'm just going to render um, render my uh, document here, my uh, Quarto document. And while I'm doing that, I'm gonna see what questions there are. So the OAuth integration um, is at the moment, uh, is that what you're asking the OAuth integration for a workbench? Oh, or just a native application. So the native application is currently just for a workbench though there is very likely our other products, Connect and Package Manager, are gonna be installed in, as a native application, um, you know, hopefully very, very soon, right? But it, it does require some engineering uh, work, so. Um, all right, so here is my Quarto document, right? So you can kind of see this, um, my attempt at some, you know, literate programming here, where I am connecting to my data, um, I'm getting some data from the CyberSense schema in Snowflake. 
I'm visualizing with it with ggplot2. I'm getting some metrics with the GT table. Also highly, highly recommend the GT table. Again, uh, multilingual R Python, just very elegant and pretty. And if you wanna create tables, I really like it. Um, and then looking at some kind of metrics and ratios over time, some nice plots, um, et cetera. But the idea here is that all of this is created using this core to document, connecting to my data in Snowflake, the very, very simple single function essentially, right? And um, not having any kind of secrets, keys, personal authentication tokens, environment files associated with my code at all, and having all of that just seamlessly pass through into my session. Um, that is it for um, my demo. I have a few more slides and then we can uh, take a uh, pause for questions. So, all right. So there are a lot of resources available to get you started. We have a quick start guide that's available on uh, Snowflake's website on analyzing data with R using Workbench and Snowflake. Um, uh, this is kind of the table of contents here. It walks you through everything from setup to accessing the data, reading and writing to the database, visualizing the data, and creating a document with, uh, with the data. Um, there's also here a free trial signup, um, as well as the link to the native application listing. There's also a YouTube demo video that's very similar to kind of this talk done by our, um, the Workbench product manager, James Blair. And then there's also a Medium blog post that's also kind of digging a little bit deeper um, into, um, uh, into what all of this kind of looks like. Um, so, at the moment, I also wanted to kind of quickly give a shout out that uh, we are hosting PositConf in 2024 in Seattle in August. And I am also running a workshop on DevOps for data scientists for those who are interested in kind of getting their code production ready. In terms of what's happening in the next few months, um, Workbench is available as a native application, um, but also Workbench is available in on-prem, in the cloud, um, kind of wherever you'd like to host it. Uh, it is, uh, as well as various other cloud managed sort of SaaS solutions, those are available as well. Um, and uh, we are hard at work at getting the rest of our Posit Pro products, including Connect and Package Manager, also available um, as a native application running within Snowpark Container Services. Um, uh, that is it for me. If you would like to contact either myself or Ralph, uh, you can do that. Um, here is our. Um, you know, information. Um, I'm also gonna make these slides and some of the code available at the GitHub repository for the solutions engineering team at Posit. It's not there yet, so please don't go here because it'll give you a 404, uh, but it will be available at github.com slash soul dash eng uh, slash armed. Um, and that is it for me. If, uh, let me put that in the, in the chat as well. Um, uh, and if you have any questions, let me know. And uh, always love talking to my fellow um, R geeks. I am an R lady through and through. So thanks everyone for having me here. Alrighty, have a good one. Any questions? That was great. Thank you both. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, by all means, feel free to, to reach out to us. We're, we're glad to help in any way we can. There's a question in the chat. In what cases does data need to move? I think it depends on what you mean by move. Just from one cloud to another. Um, I mean, I think that in general, normally you kind of choose a cloud, right? That you're, that you're happiest with, right? And that's the cloud you use. So a lot of you, uh, common clouds, right? So a snowflake can be accessed in through various clouds, right? So you can have it in 
was in um, AWS, um, Azure Cloud, uh, or Google Cloud, right? Um, I think that it is sometimes I see folks having using different cloud platforms. Uh, usually that is because of data security reasons or making sure that everything is sort of like, yes, you can build a shiny dashboard and stuff like, um, uh, usually it's because like you may want to have like redundancy for, for your data management. Um, the other thing is I also have seen it in like, um, situations where, uh, for, for companies, for example, that are like highly regulated and international. So for example, I recently worked with a customer, um, from, um, uh, uh, like a large, like a, a car com car company, and they have manufacturing plants in uh, in the U.S., in China, and, and in other places. And there are um, kind of rules and regulations around which cloud platforms are accessible in the different countries. And so, in that case, they would have them on kind of the different cloud platforms. I wouldn't say it's a very it's very typical. Usually, you have one cloud platform, and you don't need more than one, right? So. Yeah, we, we have a lot of flexibility depending on you know your environment, who you work with, and what their preferences are. So glad to have even deeper conversations on that. But we, we are very flexible uh, to accommodate you know your cloud preference of choice and, and your partner's uh, preferences. Other questions? All right.